What is up, everybody? How's it going? Um, this is going to be a presentation about how you make a presentation. And technically, doing something like this is pretty much asking for trouble, because it's a meta kind of presentation. It's quite easy to make it boring and make it empty. So I had a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides that I wanted to show in here, but just yesterday or day before that, I thought, screw this. Let's make sure that I focus on things that is going to be the most important, that I guess the most valuable for each one of you that might want to learn how you actually combine two things that are challenging alone into one thing, like playing the game at the same time and talking about it. So we're going we're gonna, to we're just, just skip through most of the PowerPoint slides very quickly, and then I'll jump into the gameplay. And there's going to be a very weird gameplay presentation, apart from the fact that we actually are going to show uh, a lot of the unshown so far, Lords of the Fallen uh, gameplay material today, I also will be doing like insight into the mind of a guy who is presenting the game. So this is going to be a weird experience. And, but I hope it's going to be valuable for people who think how it is to sort of try to play the game and at the same time try to communicate what the game is to the people who are watching it. And I've heard that it's not an easy thing to do to do both of these at the same time, so I'll just try my best. Uh, just an intro, I've, um, I've started learning how to make presentation quite a while ago, and I actually, there was a time, there was a breaking point for me, it was about, I think, 2003 or 4, uh, when I hated doing that, and I really thought I could, I wasn't even a game developer back then, I, I was working in the IT industry, and I really seriously thought about quitting the job, because I, I thought, I can't make it. I can't make presentations. This, this is not for me. I, I'm just an IT guy. I, I, I finished IT college, and, and I just want to you know, deal with computers. And apparently, after a lot of trials and a lot of incentive and motivation from my boss back then, I actually started to take to it. And here we are, I guess. And up to now, I wasn't able to, uh, to count how many presentations I've done, uh, especially the ones where I actually played the game but it's probably somewhere in between 500 and 1,000 presentations. And what I'm going to try to show you today is that there's no bullcrap in doing the presentation. You can't cheat people. What you can actually do when you present a game is constantly trying to focus on what is good in your game. I mean, I am assuming that once either one of you is going to be presenting the game, either you're pitching it or just showing it to the media, whatever you're doing, you actually believe that it's a good game. I mean, that, that's given. You have to start with that. I, I can't make that for you. You have to have a game that you actually believe that is good. And then I can try to show you how I believe you can stress that, you can leverage that, and you can try to show the best things about your game while playing that and focus on these, and then go into the presentation. Now. Very few brief informations about the flow of the presentations. When you get, let's get it started. When you, uh, when you, of course, when you start a presentation, it's really good to introduce yourself. That's uh, mainly, uh, not only so that people remember your name, this is, this is not what I'm trying to get, but I think everybody needs to know what is your role on the project that you're doing. If you're a PR guy, it's important to tell that because if you're a developer, if you're producer or programmer, people will know that. And, and it's, it's actually helpful later on, because a lot of the questions that are going to be asking is going to be filtered through that fact. And that helps. Uh, I don't personally believe in disclaimers. So uh, w when I'm starting the presentation, I don't generally tend to say, hey, our user interface is temporary. Please, these are placeholder graphics. Don't look at this pixel right here, no, 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 please don't look in here. I think this doesn't work. I personally think that if you really uh, think that something needs addressing, and you are going to be showing the gameplay or the game itself, do it back then. When, when you actually launch the whatever UI and it's clear that it's uh, temporary, you can say it back then. But don't start the presentation with 10 disclaimers. No, people don't want to hear that at the beginning. And a lot, of a lot of presentations are focused on particular spectrum or the topic. Like, for example, the gameplay presentation of Lords that I'm going to be showing you today is primarily going to be focused on combat. And that's why I believe that when you start, you should at least try to spend two or three minutes covering the topics that are not the core of this presentation. I'm going to show you an, an example of how I do it when I show the Lords gameplay. 
And all right, go with the flow. About the flow of the presentation, uh, as I said, I believe that gameplay presentations are mo most valuable because a lot of people, uh, not only a lot of people don't understand when you show them the tagline with the uh, USPs of the game, they, they can't put an image to the tagline, they, they can't connect it in their mind, or, or it's just hard, some of them can, of course, but when you show the gameplay, you can still do that. You can still play the game and talk about USPs and stress them on the fly when you show them. This is like heaven and earth. You, you can't combine these two, you can compare these two things. Um, this is a tricky one. I generally uh, try to be dynamic with when people ask questions. There are questions that you already See in your mind that you can act, uh, answer in five or ten seconds, and that's okay. You, you can like sort of do it on the fly. I generally don't say at the beginning of the presentation questions later or questions during the presentation. It has to. I think it's it's best for the flow of the presentation. But if you can see that either a question is going to take a minute to answer or it will be addressed in the later part of the presentation, just say okay, hey, I will cover that later in just a second. Bear with me, or just just. Please, let's talk about that after the presentation because there's going to be a beautiful moment in just a second and everybody's going to, you're breaking that for me and so on. Um, this is actually a simple one. It, it, it's possible that not everybody can play and talk at the same time. And, I, I, uh, and, and it's, it's perfectly doable if you split these two roles. So one, one person is driving the game and the other one is actually talking. I've done a lot of that. and. To be honest with you, on some of the most important and some of the most critical presentations that I've done, I actually preferred somebody to drive the game and I could focus on, you know, on, on, on having the right things to say in the right order and of course it requires a lot of practice, but it doesn't matter if you play and talk or somebody does it for you and you do it like in a tandem. This is also going to work. There's one rule, if you really want the most important things to be remembered from your presentation and I think it's important that you don't choose too many of them. Choose, let's say, three or four throughout the whole presentation and make sure that you address it at the very beginning. Like, Lords of the Fallen is an action RPG and that's why we're focused on combat. Then you show the combat and in a wrap of the presentation, you wrap it up again. So tell them three times. Tell them what you will say them, then say it through the presentation, especially in the most important moments because this is when they connect the dots. I mean, they, everybody, it, it could be like investor of your game. They need to see it in life, in, in action. And then at the end, just wrapping that up, make sure that it's going to be the message that everybody leaves with. And don't speak. Okay, this is a simple one. I think there are things that have devaluated with time. A lot of people, a lot of developers, a lot of enthusiasts use phrases like this. I mean, there's probably more of them. This is just two off the top of my head that I could come up with right now. And I think they don't work anymore. So try to avoid things that you think too many people have used during the presentation. Like, this is the game that I would love to play. Yeah, but you're not going to be paying for this game. So think about a game that you're doing for somebody else. And things like this. I, I think you get the idea. Is it hard to learn to master? This is good. And I actually believe Lords of the Fallen is going to be one of the games like this. But it's been used so frequently recently that you actually have to come up with something more to show how your game is unique. So I don't, th I don't think all the catchphrases work anymore. And it's always been a case like this. When you're making a presentation, and, and this is no dirty trick, this is actually something, uh, something important and something that requires skill and practice. Everybody who is watching the live gameplay demo needs to feel like they're seeing, like, like they're having a peek behind the stage, like they're seeing you playing the game, and then they can have an insight into what they won't be able to see when they are playing the game themselves, when they get it in the box, or when they are watching, like, whatever, uh, live, uh, I mean, the official gameplay video or a trailer, CGI trailer. Y y you should be adding stuff like, oh, hmm, this opponent is tough. I will try something else. I I'll try to show examples of that during the gameplay demo. Um, I will never, ever uh, overestimate and never overprice the value of the fact that the person who is presenting the game should never talk about themselves, always about the team who is making it. This is no brainer, of course. Everybody should know that, but just in case, I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you about that. Um, help your viewers connect the dots. What I mean in here is that you shouldn't uh, state things that are obvious. And what I'm saying is when you're finding a secret, you should not always uh, 
for example, just a secret. You should not always say, hey, this is a secret, I need to do this and we will do this, since you're going to be doing it anyways when you're playing the game or when you're showing the game. So try to avoid talking about things that are obvious and try to speak about things that are, um, that are interesting. And just an example of that, uh, if, you, if you will see the first gameplay uh, video of Lords of the Fallen that we have released, it was sort of purposely that when, when, uh, when the person playing and recording the video was playing it, and then we overlaid a uh, developer talking over that, it was actually me, and it was on purpose that for some parts, I'm actually speaking about the lore of the game, and for some parts, I'm actually speaking of what is going on on the screen, because some of the elements are a bit tougher to notice, so we actually have to say, hey, I found the perfect spot, perfect positioning, perfect timing, and I managed to do a critical strike. You might want to stress that, but for a lot of things, when you're doing either simple things or an exploration or people just need to look, you can talk about something else and don't comment everything that is going on on the screen. The finish, the end of the presentation is, there are a few things that you might want to include in there, uh, not to only to make a clamp and to make a nice, uh, nice ending out of this, and I'm going to be wrapping up a lot of things that we've said previously. I think it's always important to end the, the presentation with a message that people leave with, uh, like Lords of Fallen is an action RPG that is, I believe, very challenging, but we did a lot of work not to make it punishing. You can make it one sentence, but, but trying to, to sum up everything that you've shown in the presentation is important, and it's important that this elevator pitch that you're saying at the end, this catchphrase or whatever we call it, this is actually very relevant to what you've shown in the game. This is the toughest part, to make these things work together so that the one that you say at the end is not an empty phrase anymore. We're going to try to do it today. Um, of course, you can't, and, and, and I'm saying that because I have done it myself a couple of times, and this is stupid, this is foolish, you can't forget to mention at the end when your game is coming out, what genre that is, and what platforms that's coming out. This is like textbook. And time for questions. As I said, um, some of the questions will have to be answered after the presentation, so you have to plan for some questions after you actually finish showing the game. And it's also important, uh, it, and it's connected with the first point in this slide, it's also important that you try to recall what you have shown during the presentation when you actually answer the questions. So when somebody asks you, hmm, I wonder, in Lords of Fallen, how open the world is going to be? And I personally believe that the best way to tackle questions like this is, hey, remember this citadel that we started with? Then we went outside. When you explore that world, go somewhere else, you, somewhere else you get back, a huge tower in the citadel gets open to you. You've, you've seen it on the screen, right? I, I focused the camera on you. Remember that? Yeah. So this is how we explore the world, and this is how we unlock the parts of it. People need to connect these things. And... It ain't over till it's over. I'm gonna run the game right now. I'm gonna be showing you the part of the game that is, okay, let, 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 let's, let, let's start a proper presentation right now. Um, yeah. And uh, we have the starting screen. Uh, this is not gonna be a proper presentation of the gameplay, of course, because I'm gonna be talking a lot of the metadata in here. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, more of a, we can turn the sound on right now in the game. Uh, this is the uh, the starting screen. It, it's not, of course, the it's not, of course, the uh, it's not going to be the final starting screen of the game. But since I am talking a lot about the lore of the game, as I've mentioned, this 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 presentation focused primarily on the combat. I actually like that the thing that there's this hand of God because it's the icon of our lore of the game, of our background of the game. And I purposely leave this in here and I say. Lords of the Fall is an action RPG, and I stress action because we're going to be talking about combat during the presentation. But before we do that, a few words about the lore. And it's important that you make it like one minute. In our case, a couple thousand years ago, people have fought and successfully defeated their god, of course, together with this demonic army. And because of that, because of what they achieved, they actually believe that they can do crazy and, and wonderful things. So they believe they can drive evil completely out of the human nature. And because of that, they even created a codex. All the bad deeds that anybody gets caught while doing, they're tattooed on their faces. And they've been living like this for entire millennia. And right now, when the game starts, the demons started to reappear. Nobody knows why. And it's only natural for people. I mean, 
I don't, I'm not going to argue whether it's reasonable or not to believe that you can eradicate evil out of human nature. Still, they believe it. It's a foundation of what created the world, the Lords of the Fallen. And when demons spawn again, it's only natural for people, as I described them, to think, hey, let's fight evil with evil. Let's find the guy who did the most brutal and bad things in the world and put him against these demons. And this is where our hero comes in. And you're going to be fighting Harkin. And I'm also stating that because in Lords of the Fallen, we don't have character's body customization. It's important that um, I'm trying to stress, stress that because it's important that people don't expect this game to have character customization. No, why we purposely made a decision not to include it in the game. The level that we're loading right now is going to be roughly around the middle of the game. I mean, technically you can... Can I... Uh, I'm, we're going to have a cursor in here anyways. I um, hope oh, it's not going to be a big deal. Um, the level, I mean, what would a good, decent RPG be without a dungeon level? So this is one of our dungeon levels, and not a biggest one, mind you. And we're going to be, you can access that level roughly around the middle of the game. Actually, you can access it earlier if you want to, but it becomes obligatory around the middle of the game. And if you want to tackle that earlier, it, it can be very, very challenging, but you can do it. So there's an alternative and certain element of nonlinearity in the game. This opponent in here, we call them infested. They've been mutated and changed by the bad magical powers. And generally, they're very common around the opening parts of the game. So right now, this one is a little bit underpowered for me. So if I try very hard, yeah, I can actually kill him with one strike. That's possible. But, and here's, I think, an important element and uh, and, and feature of Lords of the Fallen. Whenever you meet opponents and you try to learn them after 10 or 15 encounters of these opponents, you think you know everything by, by, about them. But then comes a moment where you eventually meet opponent that looks very similar. Infested are blind, by the way. If I'm quiet, they don't notice me. And at certain moment, you are gonna be, you will notice that they actually have something new up their sleeve. It varies from opponent to opponent, and in this case, they have a new thing that they can do. I, I'm actually trying to sneak up behind this guy. And no, I didn't manage to deal a critical strike. So the important thing is, let's try to put this one to sleep as well. The player doesn't know, but these guys will actually stand up, as you can see. This guy here stood up. And this is a new skill that Infested did not have until now. And this is going to be a surprise for the players. But if I kill them again, hopefully, Nice. Okay. Uh, so th there's always element of surprise, not only in exploration, not only in levels, but also in the way that we do uh, enemies. This guy in here is a bit bigger, bit tougher. He's well armored, got a big shield, big ass sword, but also, oh, actually, I'm going to use a shield, but also he can fence quite well, which is quite challenging. So I can try to kick him, oh, if I actually reach him. Yeah, break his guard, then I can strike. Okay, that did some damage. I can try to repeat that tactics, but I'm actually trying to pull him off a different... There you go. But he actually has a, has a shield slam that can break your guard. And let me try if I can... Oh, I, I was out of energy. There you go. One mistake. And what is important, I... Generally, I, I don't try to die at this part of the presentation. I, 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 I seriously tried to fight him, but it was a bit more challenging. But there is an easy way to defeat this opponent. And also, I can right now be able to show how quickly you can get to the point in the presentation that I was before if you know everything by heart. Of course, I know these enemies right now. There's the XP that I've lost. I'm going to pick it up in just a second. But before, let's see if I can try to pull a critical strike again. Yep. Oh, my XP was in a way. You didn't see the gorgeous animation. Sorry, guys. Hey, buddy. Okay. Did he stand up? When you actually uh, kill the enemy with a critical strike, they don't stand up, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Now, these wooden planks, they're actually here for a reason. And not everybody needs to know that if you want to fight this huge guy, you can do it. It's up to you. You can try to defeat them. But there is an easy way to defeat this guy. Let's try to pull him into these wooden planks. And I'm going to tell you what is most important about this in just a second. 
You can do that if you want to do that. But, and this is, I think this is extremely worth mentioning because there are sort of two audiences of Lords of the Fallen. One of the guys are hardcore players. The other ones are ones that actually like a slightly lesser challenge, but still want it, still want their challenge. So it's important that you say that there's a trade-off in this case. If you kill this guy this way, if you drop something, you don't get it. You're, in, you're making a decision here how you want to tackle that. And the most important part about this, I mean, this is actually at least the one that, that, that I really like, is that these wooden planks are implemented in a way that it's not just scripted for this particular opponent, it's scripted for the physical weight of anything that walks onto them. If I put the heaviest, big-ass armor that we have in the game, this will actually break under me, and I don't want to do it, of course. Now, about the exploration and about the elements that we have in the game, uh, wh when you try to open some doors, there is, there, there's a hint that you can't do it, but there's always going to be a hint how to do this. In this case, if you look at the wall in here, just by the door. You can see that there's a symbol on, uh, on the wall, on the brick in here. And I don't know how many of you have noticed. I'm not going to be like, this is a secret. This is how we're going to do it. Because I'm going to make a shortcut in here. We don't have time to explore all the area. But there is a pressure plate. And this is just, this is just one of the examples of the interesting things that we're trying to do to make people explore a little bit more if they want to get everything out of the game. Now. Uh, generally, and notice that I'm not actually saying what I'm physically doing right now in the game, I'm just saying a, a, one interesting feature of the game that is very connected with what I've done. Uh, a lot of the armor sets that you find in the game are scattered across the world. Not all of them are in one place, but there are armors, and especially in the secret areas and the hidden areas, that you can actually find as a set, and that's why it's really worth exploring that game. Let me just put it on. Yeah, this is a lighter armor, so of course my moveset is going to be faster right now, but it mitigates less damage than the other one, so I have to be extra careful. And this next door, I hope it's... Yeah, at least this one is open, and I think there is a treasure in there. Can you... Yeah, you can see it. So, but if you're reckless, there you go. This is what you end up with. And this spider not only can deal quite a lot of damage to me, but... Okay, I don't want you to get stuck. Come on here. The party's over here, buddy. Come on. Oh, he's trying to lay, egg, lay eggs. I mean, I guess that's she in that case. There we go. So, it's important that you don't leave the spider alone for too long, unless you die. Let's do this. Okay, jumping attack. Always useful. Now, let me regenerate my health. Actually, what is really cool that even if I died in here, I, I, I generally, I really sometimes die in this place during the presentation. I have to get back here. What is cool, that you can take a step in, look very high, and you will see the spider on the ceiling. You will actually see that it's there, and you have time to react. But I just showed you what happens if you're not careful. But if you have enough skill, you can actually go berserk. Anyways, this new opponent in here, you can't from the get-go see that this is a new opponent. You, you can try to get closer, and then he's going to try to retreat. And if you do that, it's going to be a passive guy, and he always likes the ambushes. So, yeah. Let me see. So what I'm thinking right now, and this is a good place, I think, to show off some magic. So, magical spell. It's very effective. And actually pushed, yeah, it pushed at least one of them off, and the other one is almost done. So, what is important is that um, since magic is quite powerful in Lords of the Fallen, and I believe it's worth showing it in the moments that are very well suited for that. I could use this spell anywhere I want it, but I purposely waited for the moment where it made not only most sense, but actually showed the most important purpose of why we have designed and implemented spells in Lords of the Fallen. So I'm trying to sort of, okay, can I kick him? Yes, you can. Okay, so this guy's down, the other one. I think I put him down with a spell and he revived so I can try to sort of kill him again and I hope he's not gonna be, I mean, I hope. Good. Now, uh, for this guy in here, I can use a different weapon. We have a magical weapon uh, that is using the same magical energy. The bottom bar that I have in here, the blue one, is the magical bar, and I can switch to my gauntlet. This is a projectile type of weapon. Oh, it sometimes gets bugged, so let me just 
This is a pre-beta build. I hope you guys realize that. So there you go. I can put him on fire. I could actually right now wait till his health drains, but um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So it's important that uh, the gauntlet, the magical weapon, doesn't use as much magical energy as the spells do, because you can't, oh, what is that, buddy? I think it's a crafting ingredient that he dropped. Yeah. Runes are used uh, for crafting in Lords of the Fallen. Gauntlet does not use as much magical energy as spells, so you can actually shoot quite a couple of magical shoots, uh, shots from, from the gauntlet. So it's a different kind of tactic, still using the same type of resource, which is magical energy. Um, I'm going to save in here. This is a, this is a save uh, point, save shard. I don't know if you've noticed, but small fragments of these shards have fallen off. This is the exact number of potions I got back. So you can't abuse, you can overuse the save points because you have to wait until these get up and you're going to be able to get the, the, the same amount of potions. I can still uh, regain one more potion, but I, I think I have maximum three. That's why I only needed two and so on. I mean, we're not going to go over this too much right now. This is a bit complicated feature. Um, I also can actually spend a lot of the, uh, 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 the accumulated XP that I have in here. This is, a, this is a temporary UI, of course. But what is important, and let's focus on the features, not on how it looks, is when you're at the save point, you can bank your XP. I think it's very important in Lords of the Fallen that there is, a, there is an element of play it safe if you want it. If you bank your XP, this is how you do it. I think I had like, what, 1,500 or something. And I can bank it in here right now. So I have to, I think I have, yeah, I have two attribute points to spell. You can spend it on the attributes if you want, or you can spend it on the spells. Uh, these cost differently, and uh, spells are assigned to your class while attributes are class independent. A bit of technical uh, elements of Lords. And I won't be spending that right now, because I want to do it right before the boss fight, because I want to make sure I invest my XP in exactly what I think is going to be needed for that particular boss fight, which is coming up very close for now. I forgot to mention one more uh, important thing about the shards. Between where we started the game, the, the presentation, and right now, you can already get a rough idea of how frequently the save points are going to be distributed in Lords of the Fallen, and it's probably also giving you an idea that you're not going to be backtracking the whole location to get to a boss fight, to get in there. This is one of the other purposeful design decisions that we've made. OK, I know. This is a turtle guy sneaking behind his shield. I have my spell ready. What do you say I use it? Hello. And I, let me try to get to him and finish him. But uh-oh, there is a spider. So if I actually go out in here right now and wait uh, behind this, this corridor, the spider won't follow me. At least this one, but of course, and some players won't know it by now. But if I leave, leave the spider in here, oh, I need to regenerate, I need to prepare, oh, I gotta get in and, and kill the spider. Uh, she, I guess, will take her time and lay eggs that will hatch very soon. So when you get back into this room, it might be very nasty. So you know why I paused the game while talking about that. But still, there you go, there's one egg she managed to lay. I'm trying not to stop dealing damage so that she doesn't have time to, uh, but still, she can make it. OK. And there's another spider. Mm-hmm. Let me try to see how I can tackle that. This is going to be tough. Oh, and she's laying eggs. Nope. Let me see if I can destroy. Oh, OK, I destroyed the egg. OK. Oh, I don't have the energy. Let me regenerate my energy. AOE. Nice. Did I kill the small spider? OK, I did. I think I was lucky. Did you see the amount of health that I have? Nice. OK. Um, so yeah, this is a boss fight. We're going to be entering an arena very soon. I'm going to tell you about the boss in just a moment. But before we do that, however, just real quick look around the place. Yeah, so there's a lever that actually opens the arena. And before I get in, I want to do two things. First one, I really don't want to miss any detail in this room because, yeah, there's a treasure chest in here. And this one actually contains a weapon that I think it's really cool. It's a very different weapon, so I, I might as well put it, uh, put it on and try to fight with him. But I also believe uh, fight with the champion bus uh, that we're going to be fighting in just a second is very interesting if you use this particular weapon. Before that, however, let's spend the experience that we have and upgrade our character. I think, okay, three points. So we have three points. I actually put him 
I'll put two in agility and one in vitality. So I have a little bit more HP and I will also change, so to say. I'll use, yeah, three-bladed claw. I look like a superhero, don't I? Not bad. And I won't be using a shield. Uh, here's my shield. I won't be using that. I think, yeah, this is a really fast moveset. So it's important that I, I combined quite a lot of elements in, in here to make sure that my, um, my playing style is fit to this boss playing style because that's how I personally like it. And you're going to have a lot of freedom about that in Lord of the Fallen. So one of the things that I wanted to do is take off the shield so I'm lighter. The, uh, I'm actually going to use the save point so my potions are back and my health is back because I will need all the potions. And you can see that these small shards already, uh, already uh, floated back. So you can use it or you can use it again. Um, this boss is a boss that really likes to get in close and he's not using any long weapons, he's not using a lot of projectile attacks, so he's primarily going to be trying to get close to you and dealing a lot of very quick and very powerful strikes with his fists. They have closer range, but they're very devastating if you're too close. So I was thinking, I feel lucky and I feel cocky today, I'm going to try to counter that with exact same tactics, but there's a certain symmetry to this fight because this boss has a rage meter that is filled with, if he deals a lot of damage in a short amount of time, his rage fills and it can trigger a special rage mode. But the interesting part and the symmetry of this fight is that you can actually try to stagger him with doing the same thing, dealing a lot of damage in a short amount of time. And if you do that, uh, you can actually uh, if you stagger him, you can deal even more damage. And if you manage to deal enough damage to stagger him again, the second, uh, second stagger will be even longer. So it's worth trying to do that. So this fight is actually a strike for strike kind of thing. So here we go. Okay, that was a charge. I didn't get out. That was a, he was attempting a grab attack, but I wasn't in range. This is a shockwave kind of attack. And... Important thing about the, uh, the claws or a dual wielded weapon that I have, this is actually... Ah, uh, bad timing is bad. This is, actually the, uh, this is actually an interesting rogue kind of weapon. We weapons are not associated to your class in any hard way. I'm trying to find a time window to heal in here. Okay, let's do it like this. Can I make him... Okay, once again. Oh, okay, yeah, he's gonna charge, I guess. Good. So, uh, you can actually trigger combos. If you, if you use dual wielded weapon. Oh, this is rage. Not good, not good, I wanna get out. Okay, this is an AOE. Uh, rage increases his damage so much that I actually prefer to wait it out because uh, it's a one mistake thing right now. If I get hit, most probably it's a one shot. I'm really playing it safe right now. And one more thing, I can also try to use my gauntlet in that case and put him on fire. I mean, why not? Looks cool. Okay, I'm also, uh, okay, the rage wore off. So let's see if I can stagger him. Yeah, I actually did. He was trying to pull off a special attack, but this is the third stage of this fight. Within each stage, of course, new attacks are being introduced. So finally, he has his projectile attack. Oh, I staggered him, almost. But uh, time window was too short. I didn't get it on time. Actually, it's way better if you learn it so much that you know when you stagger him. This is a combo, very effective. Okay, I think he's a one shot for me. Nice. Good. I didn't die. That actually doesn't happen quite often during this presentation, uh, which, is, uh, which is good because I tend to try the first attempt on a champion uh, in, a, in a as spectacular way as I can. So I'm trying to go all in and I play a bit of it safer right now, so that's why I actually didn't die. And what is also cool is when I, when I, when I restart that fight during the presentation, that sometimes happen, I actually try to use different tactics. I, I put way more magic in, for example. I use consumables that uh, speed up the regeneration of magical energy so I can maybe not spam uh, spells, 
but I can use them like every 30 seconds or so, which is way more effective and it helps you overcome the fight if the first attempt was just too difficult or you needed more and so on and so on and so on and so on. And now, of course, is a good place to wrap up what you guys have seen. Everything that is, that is most important about Lords of the Fallen is the fact that there's a lot of player freedom, but in terms of the gameplay aspect of that game. This is not a game about non-linear storyline choices. Still, I believe it's going to feature a very interesting storyline about Harkin, our main hero. But the main element of Lords of the Fallen is how you craft your fighting style. So you have magical, you have three pillars of character development. Magical combat, which are spells and the gauntlet, of course, you can actually craft gauntlet in 18 different ways, even with runes. I mean, the, the most obvious ones are like poison, fire, but you can even craft it with luck if you want to. This is going to be very interesting. And the second one are stats, and the third one is the gear that you use. Gear is craftable, some of it has perks, so there's a lot of freedom. And mixing that is going to be a lot of challenge to balance it actually well, but we're working hard. And that's pretty much it. Um, summing up the, the meta presentation that I've done in here, I was trying to show you that um, the reason why it's hard to make a gameplay presentation and at the same time talk about what you are showing is not only the sort of mind share kind of focus and, and multitasking kind of thing, but also it's important that you have to remember that people not only need to get out of this presentation with thinking that this game looked good. Did you actually notice that I didn't mention anything about the graphics about this game? I, I think this is one of these things that speaks for itself. I really believe that Lords looks gorgeous, but I don't think there's a reason in, in putting my finger on certain particle effects in this game. I, I really think that you know people appreciate it on their own. This is one of the things that was more of underlying. And I think there's an Easter egg that I have for the end of this presentation. I don't know how many of you noticed that the titles of the slides in here were actually the names of the songs. Did anybody recognize that? Anybody? Yeah? W which song is that? Who, who wrote that one? Anybody knows that? Slipknot. Nice. Anybody? Let's get it started. Of course, Black Eyed Peas. Go with the flow. Yes. Uh, don't speak. No brainer. Is there any doubt about what, what Ben made this? No, okay. Okay, Undisclosed Desires. Muse, of course. The Doors, yes. And? Yes, Lenny Kravitz. All right. Thank you very much, guys. That was a gameplay presentation about presentations. Thanks a lot. Thank you.